on my calendar this afternoon. So don't forget, in 2017, that, that birthday. Okay, well thank you so much guys for being here today. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. <clears throat> However, to get started with talking about what Jesus said in the book of John, I'm going to first talk out of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the captured priest, enlisted in God's corpse of prophets, was no stranger to bad news and bad circumstances. Ezekiel lived in exile from his homeland, and he was there at the time in which his people were conquered and captured by the ruthless Babylonians. He saw all of the horrors and the tragedies that unfolded when his people were so violently uprooted from their homeland. In addition, he daily witnessed the struggles and the hardships of his people living in, captiv in, in captivity under an oppressive, oppressive regime. And on top of all of that, he also had to suffer through the sudden and unexpected death of his wife while in captivity. But with a name that literally meant God strengthens, he pressed on dutifully, obediently, in service to the God who had never turned his back on him and from whom he never intended to turn his own back. And maybe that's why God chose Ezekiel to reveal his plan to renew and restore his apostate and now exiled people. Through Ezekiel, God spoke these words to Israel in exile. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. What a promise. What an assurance in such a terribly bad and exceedingly dark circumstance. God is promising to graciously restore his people from exile, a people that were prone to idolatry and bloodshed. In fact, that's the consistent reason that God gives for their exile in the book of Ezekiel. They shed innocent blood and they committed idolatry constantly. God was going to take that people, that stubborn, rebellious, hard-hearted people, and he was going to restore them by an act of sheer, sovereign grace. What about those old routines, those old proclivities? Well, this is where the promise that God makes to Ezekiel comes in. To insulate his people from future apostasy, from returning to the old routines and the old habits. He'll give them a new spirit. And he'll give them a new heart. What kind of spirit would God give them? Would it be some ill-defined, impersonal spirit, more along the lines of a new mood or a new attitude? No, that's not what he says to Ezekiel. According to God, this would be God's own spirit that he was going to give to his people. And that gifting of his spirit wouldn't just be temporary. And that was an obvious concern because Israel was actually acquainted with God's spirit. They were acquainted with God's spirit and the way that that spirit interacted with them through their own encounters as well as through the revelation of their own scriptures. Israel first meets the spirit of God in the very first verse of their entire Bible. Genesis 1-1, where they see that the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters of what I would call pre-creation. That, that is the time before God actually began forming the earth into a livable environment. There in Genesis 1-1 we read, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then of course immediately after that, creation happens. But then 
as the scriptures progressed, the Israelites could read about God's Spirit giving new revelation, like He did with prophets such as Balaam and Isaiah. They could read about God's Spirit resting upon, or in some cases, rushing upon certain individuals in order to empower them to lead and make wise judgments among the people. We think of some of the Israelite judges like Othniel and Samson. We see sometimes that the Spirit of God rushes upon individuals to empower and equip them to lead in military victory. I'm thinking of men like Joshua and Gideon. At other times, men like Bezalel and Ohalia were filled with the Spirit of God in order to give them special skills, intelligence, and craftsmanship in planning and devising the tabernacle of God. And still other times, the Spirit of God empowered His prophets to speak words of deliverance or words of, 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 of destruction to the appropriate audience at the appropriate time. But in all of those instances, the Spirit of God was fleeting. It didn't stay around very long, and it was never given to everybody. It was always given to select people for a select purpose, and then it was gone. So this promise of God, given to the prophet Ezekiel, that he would give his people a new heart and a new spirit by putting his own spirit within them, was a fresh and exciting idea. God would give his powerful spirit to, according to his own words, cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. And then next comes God's illustration in a very vivid and unforgettable picture. Do you remember what comes next in the, in the story of Ezekiel? It's Ezekiel chapter 37. And that's where God takes Ezekiel on a visionary journey in the middle of a valley filled with dry bones. There, God orders Ezekiel to prophesy to those bones that they might receive flesh and blood. And Ezekiel obeys. And as soon as he prophesies, the bones receive flesh and blood. But there's a problem remaining. They're still only corpses. They are still dead. They are still inanimate. They've been refashioned into a new physical army of bodies. But there was no breath in them. So then God commands Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath. Interestingly, the same word for breath translates the Hebrew word wind, translates the Hebrew word spirit. They have no breath in them. So God commands Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath, prophesy to the wind, prophesy to the spirit. To breathe on these dead bodies so that they might live. So Ezekiel does what he's told. And breath flows into the corpses and they live. And now they are a newly fashioned army of God's people brought back from total death. Remember, they're just a pile of bones. That's deader than dead. He brings them back from total death now to new, restored, total Life. And listen to how God describes it. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. This is Israel speaking. This is how God is characterizing their speech. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from the graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit, my breath, my wind within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it declares the Lord. So pay careful attention to what's happening. In this place, God is promising two different things. First of all, He promises that
that his people, although they seem as good as dead, although they stand at the brink of hopelessness, he's promising that his people will experience two waves of restoration and renewal. One way we'll see Israel restored physically. That is, they'll be reconstituted as a nation. They'll be brought back to the land and they'll exist as a national people group once more. But that won't be the end. It won't simply be a physical restoration. The next wave will be a spiritual restoration. A revival of zeal. A revival of dedication and devotion to God. And that restoration, that renewal happens when God gives His Spirit to them and places that Spirit inside of them. Unsurprisingly, that captivating imagery and that new and fresh idea of God's Spirit coming upon an entire people, not just one or two here or there, that turns up again and again in the Old Testament prophets. For instance, in Joel, God promises to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. Isaiah hears God promise to pour out His Spirit on all the descendants of Israel. And even more intriguing in Isaiah, he hears that God <coughs> is going to place His Spirit on one specific person for a very specific purpose. One such example in Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 5 says, There shall come forth, now listen to the language and see if you can make the connection. <coughs> there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness should be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. So what are we to make of all that? What were Ezekiel's readers to make of all that? What were Isaiah's readers and Joel's readers to make of all of that? Well, this is where we intersect with the story of John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, we are introduced to the eternal word who was both with God and simultaneously God himself. This eternal word, John says, became flesh and pitched his tent with humanity. And his name, we're told, was Jesus. And it was to this Jesus that John the baptizer, the prophet before the prophet, it was to this Jesus that John the baptizer said that he saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. That's how John had been told by God that he could recognize the one sent by God, the one who was anointed with the Holy Spirit of God. <coughs> and from there we're told with reference to Jesus that not only was he given the Spirit of God, but he was given the Spirit, Spirit of God without all of the usual restraints. In fact, in John 3.34, we're told that he was given the Spirit without measure. And then the teaching ministry of Jesus begins. And when that teaching ministry begins, Jesus, we hear as we listen to his words, begins to place incredible emphasis on this Spirit of God, on this Holy Spirit, and on the Spirit's role of converting the world to God and producing children that were born out of God's Spirit rather than the flesh of men. Finally, on the eve of his death, just hours before he is to be executed, Jesus gives the most lengthy description of the Holy Spirit and his identity, his relation to his disciples, and to the mission that the Spirit possesses. He starts the conversation like this in John 14, verses 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor 
world knows him. You know him because he dwells with you and he'll be in you. And Jesus ends the discussion on the Spirit with the words of our opening text this morning. <clears throat> I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. What's the truth, Jesus? It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I do go away, I will send him to you. So notice carefully what's happening here. With the beginning of Jesus' ministry, talk of the Spirit of God begins to grow and intensify until finally it reaches its culmination in Jesus' discussion of the Holy Spirit in reference to His disciples. This tells the reader that the Old Testament prophecy that we read about in Ezekiel and Joel and Isaiah are about to start their fulfillment. And notice further what Jesus says about the sending of the Spirit. This is very interesting. He says, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. Now imagine this, this question in your minds. Can you, can you think of a situation in which it would actually be advantageous not to have Jesus as close and as present as possible? Can you imagine a situation like that? Well, according to Jesus, such a situation was possible. And it was about to come to fruition at the close of Jesus' own ministry. Remember what he said? It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. So why might it be more advantageous for Jesus' bodily absence and, and in its place to have the presence of the Spirit? Why? Well, the answer lies in the significance of the Spirit's coming. The Spirit, the Helper, only comes when Jesus goes away. But Jesus' going away means something. And it accomplishes something. Jesus' going away means His death, His resurrection, His ascension, and His exaltation. Jesus' going away means forgiveness and mercy and grace for the rest of the world. So the absence of Jesus and the presence of the Spirit means that redemption has been paid for. Salvation is here and the powers of Satan are defeated. And then, with the incoming presence of the Spirit, knowledge, precious, sacred knowledge of the fuller, deeper revelation of God in Christ will now be opened and brought to the minds of Jesus' disciples. Only by Jesus' bodily absence and the presence of the Holy Spirit will Jesus' disciples fully understand who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and how God has acted through Jesus to bring to fulfillment His promises of salvation and deliverance. And that's exactly why Jesus says about the Spirit's coming in verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak from His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. You see, there was truth about Jesus that could not and would not be known outside the Holy Spirit's coming. <laughs> The Holy Spirit was sent to reveal Christ more fully and thereby, with that fuller revelation made available, make Christ's glory more widely known, more widely visible, and more widely experienced. Thus, we find the summary description of the Spirit's work in verses 14 through 15. 
He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So friends, the Spirit was sent ultimately to glorify Christ by declaring Christ's message in a full and clear way and by guiding the minds of the disciples into the fuller, deeper truths of Jesus Christ. Truths that the, that the disciples were not able to bear up under at that particular moment. Truths that they were not able to understand given where they were located in God's story of redemption. That is why the Spirit has been sent. That is the primary mission of the Holy Spirit today, to glorify Christ by revealing Christ more fully. Now back up with me for just a moment. It's important that we notice what's entailed in this grand, sweeping mission that the Holy Spirit has of glorifying Christ by revealing Christ. Look at verses 8 and 11. In those three verses, this is what Jesus says that the Spirit is going to do when He comes. And when He comes, Jesus says, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in Me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see Me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So in the mission of glorifying Christ, the Holy Spirit actually has a three-pronged approach. First of all, he's going to convict the world. It's very interesting, by the way, that Jesus in this final discourse starts referring to the Holy Spirit as he. That gives us the additional insight that the, that the sending of God's Spirit is not some sending of an impersonal force. It is the sending of a personal power. It is the sending of a distinct personality that is separate and apart from the Son. But He, the Holy Spirit, is going to be sent to convict the world of sin. Because in the world's unbelief toward Jesus, the world fails to believe Jesus' message about its own sin and about its own guilt. And that unbelief toward Jesus will bar them from the access to life that God offers through His Holy Son. Further, the Spirit is going to convict the world of its own righteousness, or rather, it may be more accurate to say, the failure of the world's misguided and upside-down notion of righteousness. A misguided, upside-down notion of righteousness that leads it to reject and disbelieve Jesus. And because Jesus is going to the Father, it's no longer going to be His role to convict them of that particular sin. It's going to be the Holy Spirit's responsibility. But the Holy Spirit is going to accomplish that responsibility in and through the disciples of Jesus to whom Jesus is sending Him. So it then falls to the disciples by the power of that Spirit to convict the world concerning its upside-down and misguided understanding of what is truly right. So long as the world consistently rejects and disbelieves Jesus, its version of righteousness is false. It's a false righteousness. If it's a righteousness that leads it to reject Christ. And finally, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of its misguided and misplaced judgment, insofar as the Holy Spirit judges and condemns the world's ruler, that is, the one who, who exerts the most influence within the world, namely Satan. And the world, if it's following the evaluations and the judgments of its ruler, Satan, then it follows that its own evaluations and judgments must be false, because they're following the evaluations and the judgments of Satan. And nowhere is that more fully manifest than when the world rejects Jesus. Nowhere are those false evaluations and those false judgments no more obvious than when the world rejects the sinless and holy Son of God. So that, therefore, is where the story of God's Spirit takes us today. 
The impersonal it turns out to be a personal he. And he comes with power to equip the disciples of Jesus for the high calling of glorifying Christ in everything that we do. And in doing so, he uses Jesus' disciples to convict the unbelieving world of sin, to convict the unbelieving world of a false righteousness, and to convict the unbelieving world of a false sense of judgment and evaluation. He is the Holy Spirit. And his concern is with all things holy for the glory and magnification of Christ. So therefore, our statement of faith reads about the Holy Spirit like this. We believe in the Holy Spirit who is coexistent and co-equal with the Father and Son. By His power, He raised Jesus from the dead and brought to the remembrance of the apostles all the things that Jesus taught them. By His guidance and influence, the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, was authored. He is the comforter of the church and the individual gift to every believer who repents and is baptized. He personally dwells within each Christian, empowering them for holiness and interceding for them in prayer. Now that description of the Holy Spirit and His ministry began with Jesus' own teaching, starting in John 14 and ending in John 16 with reference to the Spirit. And that description grew and grew insofar as the apostles' understanding and comprehension grew and grew via the guiding of the Spirit. And insofar as they continually understood the plan of God and the purpose of God in Christ. That's why later on Peter could command the inquiring sinners on Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul could say later on that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. That's why Paul could later refer to the product of the Christian life as the fruit of the Spirit. And that's why Paul and the other New Testament authors could regularly quote from the Old Testament and assign the quotation to the Holy Spirit. And by the way, based upon what Jesus says here about the Spirit guiding the apostles into all the truth and bringing to the remembrance of their minds the things that Jesus taught, we also can include the same about the New Testament. That it is the product of the guiding and leading and influence of the Holy Spirit as He interacted with the minds of those first disciples of Jesus. And this is why our statement of faith about the Bible reads this way. <coughs> we believe that the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, is the Word of God, having been produced by divine inspiration, whereby the Holy Spirit guided and influenced human authors to pen its words. It is without error in the original manuscripts, and it is infallible in what it affirms. We believe that it is the sole rule of faith and practice for all Christians, and the final authority in all matters pertaining to what is true and what is right. So the Spirit, ladies and gentlemen, is the gift as well as the giver. He is the power and yet He is the guide. He is the revealer and yet He is the teacher. That's what the Old Testament prophets were talking about and that's what they longed to see. And that was the ultimate expression of the revival and restoration that God had shown to Ezekiel and prophesied to Isaiah and Joel. So naturally, we should want to ask this question, where is all of that in us today? Where's the payoff for 21st century Christians? What is the gift of the Holy Spirit for? Well, I think the simplest answer is supplied by Jesus' own words to his disciples. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. I would suggest that that is the sum total of the Spirit's work in the lives of Jesus' followers. We receive the gift, we receive the power, we receive the enabling of the Holy Spirit.
Spirit as the means of our glorifying Christ. We receive the Spirit's sanctifying influence. We receive His guidance in moral decision making. We receive His gifts in order to serve effectively through the church in order to make much of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now the corollary of that is very important for us to understand. The corollary of that is that the Holy Spirit is not sent to us simply for our own sake. He's not sent to us strictly so that we can be better moms, better dads, better employees, better employers, for our own sakes, as a simple act of life improvement. He, sent, he is sent, rather, He is gifted to us to make us better moms, better dads, better employees, better employers, for the sake of Jesus' name. He's not sent to tell us whether we're supposed to take the next right-hand turn or the next left-hand turn. If somehow he does do that, he's not doing so for our own benefit. He's doing so in order to position us to witness more boldly and more effectively for Christ. The Holy Spirit is not me-centered. His gift to me is not about me. It's about Christ. The strength that he gives and the influence that he exerts in my life is aimed squarely at magnifying the infinite worth, the infinite value, the exceeding preciousness of Jesus and what he has done. It's directed at making Christ's salvation known and informing the world that its sins and its righteousness and its judgments are terribly and disastrously misinformed when it leads the world to reject Christ and to reject His teaching. Christians, I hope that we can grasp that truth today. I hope that your heart is prepared to accept that description. I hope that you can get on board with why we've been given the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is about exalting Jesus and not us. The Spirit is about gospel testimony and about trans transformed lives of holiness that reflect the proof of the power of the gospel. So this then is what we need to ask for. This is the power of the Spirit that we need to expect and that we need to be looking for. The Spirit is not sent to us so that when we're feeling spiritually dry, so to speak, He can give us a kind of boost. Feeling spiritually dry doesn't mean that He's not indwelling you. As a Christian, He is always indwelling you. But what the Scriptures regularly teach in terms of the Spirit's interaction with the disciples is that He is most active and His presence is most obvious and felt when we are engaged in the mission of making Christ known. As proof of that, I would challenge you to read the book of Acts very carefully. In that book, the Holy Spirit is on the move from beginning to end, and yet we see Him acting in the most mighty and overt ways in the lives of men and women when they are involved in the mission. And when they are doing the mission, he wasn't there simply as a kind of afternoon pick-me-up. He wasn't there as a mood booster. Friends, he was power from on high to increase the Christian's ability to make Jesus known and to carve out opportunities to do the same. So again, we are gifted with the Spirit to glorify Christ. And if you feel that you've not felt his power, if you feel that you have not experienced His presence, His work in your, life, in your life recently, then might I suggest that you evaluate whose mission you've actually been committed to most recently. Is it your own mission? Self-approved, self-appointed, endorsed by you? Have you simply been asking the Holy Spirit to join you in your plans? If so, Christian, maybe it's time to get back to his agenda of glorifying Christ. Maybe it's time to stop asking the Holy Spirit to join you in your plans. And maybe it's time to start asking him to let you join his.
Amen. So right now we invite you into that spirit-filled life. We invite you into that spirit-led life, a life devoted to the glory of God in Jesus Christ, a life devoted to making His salvation known and felt. Jesus died to bear your sins to the cross. He resurrected to inaugurate God's new creation, and He's ascended into heaven to begin the final phase of God's incoming reign. So if you recognize today your need for this grace, this forgiveness, this mercy, and this power for holy testimony, we exhort you right now to believe on Jesus Christ, to turn away from your sins, and to be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins as we stand together and sing this next song. Amen.
Okay. I didn't get the attorney's name as a young man. Um, but that's the one.